Well, I'm sure that my life is being much more enriched by you than you are by me. And I'm thankful for the privilege of being with you these days. I've been greatly blessed by your fellowship and by your love and warmth, and, and that really makes up for the temperature outside. <laughs> so if you'd open your Bibles, we'll just turn to the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And uh, beginning with the 15th verse, read through the end of the chapter. Dr. John A. Mackay, or Mackay probably in Scotland, uh, at Princeton, formerly of Princeton, said that it was the study of the letter of Paul to the Ephesians when he was a young man with his concept of the unification of the whole human race and the harmonizing of all things in heaven and on earth under the headship of Jesus Christ that so challenged and thrilled him that he resolved to commit his life to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That happened when he was 14 and 18 years of age, and he continued a glorious service <clears throat> and marvelous commitment as long as he lived. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And I come at somewhat a disadvantage tonight. I had my outline for the message tonight ready several months ago, and then almost overnight all of Eastern Europe interrupted and disrupted my message. <laughs> and I join you in thanksgiving for that, not for the message being interrupted, but for what has happened in Eastern Europe. And then I thought I had it all ready after staying up late several nights last week and revising it and getting up early the next morning and retyping it three or four different times. And then I got here yesterday afternoon and listened to four men just go right down the line point for point. I don't know where they got a copy of it. But. <laughs> and then the this uh, morning, my colleague from the Foreign Mission Board, Jim Maroney, uh, took the rest of what I had to say. <laughs> so I'm going to try to treat it a little differently than I had intended, and uh, I'm not going to worry you with the repetition of definitions of some of these terms, but try to look at them from the standpoint of how do we as Christians react to these various characteristics that we anticipate will qualify the 21st century? As we try to peer through windows on the 21st century world and on the 1990s of yet the 20th century. 
And in some of my readings and then thinking back in church history as, as well as I can remember back about a century ago when I was studying it, <laughs> I have discovered that the decade of the 90s for more than a thousand years has been a decade of great expectations, hopes, aspirations, anticipation of the end of time, the millennium, or whatever. And I find that it is no different today. Somebody wrote, today we are emerging from a 20th century version of the Dark Ages. The combined impact of industrialization, totalitarianism, and intrusion of technology into our lives. With most of the century behind us and the millennium ahead, we are entering a re renaissance in the arts and spirituality. The magnet year 2000 is pulling forth bold experiments in market socialism, a spiritual revival, and a burst of economic growth around the Pacific Rim. The writer of that paragraph, John Nisbet, and his co-author, Patricia uh, Arber Aberdeen, also wrote in the opening paragraphs of their book entitled Megatrends 2000, Gateways into the 20th Century, the trends of the 90s will influence the important elements of your life, your career and job decisions, your travel and business, your investment choices, your place of residence, your children's education. To make the most of this extraordinary decade, you must be aware of the changes that will surround you. Events do not happen in a vacuum but in a social, political, cultural, and economic context. This, this book describes for you that context. You need not agree, you need not agree with or accept every element of this worldview, but do use this structure as a context within which to measure the means of the day, to measure the news of the day, opposing viewpoints, and new information. The important thing is to craft your own worldview, your own personal set of megatrends to guide your work, your ideals and relationships, and your contributions to society. I mentioned some of the things that have happened in the decade of the 90s in other centuries. In 1492, you know the rest of that. In 1792, what happened? Carey. William Carey and the birth of the modern missionary movement. Also, in the 1790s, the Great Awakening, perhaps the greatest moral, spiritual revolution in the history of the United States, began. It began in some small churches along the banks of the James River in Virginia. As people deeply burdened and concerned about the moral trends, the drunkenness, the crime, the immoralities that threatened to destroy that newly independent country. And they began praying. And the spirit of revival spread from Virginia all the way up through New England, all the way down to Georgia, and westward as far as Kentucky. There were many kinds of excesses, but there were tens of thousands of conversions. The president of Harvard University led the revival in that school that caused the rationalists and the immoral and the skeptics to turn in great numbers from their godlessness to true godliness. At Yale University, there came a group known as the participants in the Haystack Prayer Meeting. 
And out of that group came Adoniram Judson, Luther Rice, and others who helped change the course of missions and of Christian history throughout the world. In the 1890s, as in the ninth, as in the 990s, and in most of the decades called 90s, there have been extraordinary movements, some of them very extreme and excessive, and some even with abuses, some extremely secular, some extremely religious, as people anticipated anything might happen with the coming of a new century. This time, it's not only a new century, it's a new millennium that begins 10 years from now in the year 2000. So as we look at this coming decade and the century uh, uh, before us, we will do well to recall these words. We stand at the dawn of a new era. Before us is the most important decade in the history of civilization. See what people think when they're entering the decade of the 90s. A period of stunning technological innovation, unprecedented economic opportunity, surprising political reform, and great cultural rebirth. These two authors go on to suggest ten overarching trends that will influence our lives in this decade and constitute gateways to the 21st century. And I'm going to read these ten ideas of theirs. One, the booming global economy of the 1990s. Two, a renaissance in the arts. Three, the emergence of free market socialism. Four, global lifestyles and cultural nationalism. Five, the privatization of the welfare state. Six, the rise of the Pacific Rim. Seven, the decade of women in leadership. Eight, the age of biology. Nine, the religious revival of the new millennium. And ten, the triumph of the individual. Nisbet and the co-author uh, Aberdeen, A-B-U-R-D-E-N-E, I suppose that's somewhere near the pronunciation, have uh, a very optimistic view on these various points. So much so that all the doomsayers and the gloom spreaders are very condemnatory of this book and they reject it outright because you know there's some people that are not happy unless they can spread gloom and doom. Now I don't know who's right. As I told you this afternoon, the name is Underwood, not Ezekiel. <laughs> By the way, I don't think I've ever had an audience that looked down on the preacher as much as here. <laughs> But before I found this book a week ago, I had listed seven megatrends as I saw them, or, or characterizations. One, cataclysmic change. Two, globalization. Three, Asianization. Four, urbanization. And I run out of the Asians. <laughs> Biotechnocracy. And we might say just te technology of all kinds new frontiers, and sadly, continuing destitution on a multinational scale. How many of these will be actual? I do not know. 25 years from now, when I'm long gone, you can look back with perfect 2020 hindsight and laugh at some of the absurdities predicted in 1990. But one thing of which I am certain, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is at work in history. History is not bound by any dialectic determinism, 
God is at work. He operates vertically to the historical forces as well as horizontally. How soon his divine purpose shall be realized, I know not. Of one thing, though, I am convinced that according to that mystery made known to us through Jesus Christ, it is the purpose of God and entirely within the province of his unfailing ability to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. This means, writes the late Dr. John McKay of Princeton, that God has constituted Jesus Christ the unifying center of a vast scheme of unity whereby the celestial and terrestrial orders, separated as they now are by the great gulf between the supernatural and the natural and the greater gulf between the holy and the sinful, shall be joined together in a united commonwealth. The rift shall have been totally overcome. Through Christ, the warring factions become members of the same body, the new man, the new humanity, the new Israel, which is constituted by the Christian church. The meaning clearly is that God proposes to relate to himself in one great family, people whom historical hates, cultural differences, social status have held apart. The unifier is Jesus Christ, and the unifying principle is the gospel. Continuing, he says, on the basis of the context of Ephesians 3.10, as a result of the transforming and unifying action of the church in history, spirits both good and evil, who are higher than human spirits, shall by contemplating this churchly activity obtain their deepest insight into the wisdom the many-colored wisdom of God. There is no sublimer thought in the Ephesian letter or in any scripture than this. The history of the Christian church becomes a graduate school for angels. By studying the body of Christ, intelligences superior to our own will receive new flashes of insight into the divine nature they will come to understand things which had been inscrutable in God's dealings with men, and they catch a vision of the ultimate splendor and dimensions of the Creator's purpose in Christ. And with that conviction of the certainty of the triumph of Jesus Christ and of God in the carrying out of his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ before the foundation of the world, let us turn our glance to some of the characteristics, possibly, of the next century and of this immediate decade. And the first to which I call your attention is cataclysmic changes. As Chancellor Helmut Kohl stated two weeks ago, uncertainty is almost the only thing that is certain about Europe in the year and decade ahead. The movement modifying Europe is not ready to stop. It is impossible to foresee to today everything awaiting us, but one thing is sure, Europe will be more diversified. And as a journalist wrote, with the eastern glacier disintegrating, the year and the decade ahead promise change, opportunity, and more surprises. Already we see those changes at work in Azerbaijan, Armenia, the Ukraine, Yugoslavia, the Balkan states, and even in Albania. We can be sure, I believe, that the seething dissatisfaction in China will boil over into the mightiest mass movement for freedom the world has yet seen. Vital and necessary changes will occur in the Middle East and in South Africa. The aspiration of the soul for freedom and human dignity may be long deferred. It cannot be permanently denied. What a sight that was in Eastern Europe a few weeks ago 
when by television we watched the wall come tumbling down and the breakthrough of 300 million people. And even as we rejoice in these overwhelming movements toward freedom and self-government, we are compelled to recognize also that the immediate future is fraught with peril. Long suppressed desires clamor quite naturally for immediate resolution. Yet those who so abruptly have been thrust into the political machinery necessary for governing the body politic have had no opportunity for 40 years or more to even so much as vote. How can they be instantaneously prepared for the role of solving acute and terrifying problems and with what resources? Multitudes desire instantaneous remedies when delays are inevitable further revolt and violence may occur. God grant that the progress may continue as it has for these weeks with such a minimum of violence, but we need to be much in prayer for the continuing intervention of God himself and for him to raise up people who can help lead with such charisma and vision and genuine statesmanship that these problems may be overcome and the nations built up and the problems resolved. But let us as Christians seize the opportunity to be co-workers with God for the reshaping of the world in this time of cataclysmic change. And we'll come back to some ideas and some things that are already happening in that area before we are done. The second qualification or characteristic, perhaps, of this next century will be, as you have heard several times already, globalization. The one world idea proclaimed by Wendell Wilkie in 1940 has finally become a reality in many senses today. And because you have heard already yesterday and today so much about this, I will merely mention the some of the areas in which this globalization is taking place, the intertwining of nations, of economies, of educational systems, of telecommunications, of fashion design and behavioral patterns, of lifestyle generated somewhat by the music that is instantaneously with the speed of sound or the speed of light rather than just the speed of sound spread around the world. Today, we are a global society. Now, one benefit from all of this globalization is it has now dawned upon people that war is an obsolete way of solving problems. Now, economic security is more important than political security. Economic power is more important than military power in determining a nation's influence. But let me suggest that globalization was some of what Jesus Christ contemplated in the Glorious Commission when he said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my disciples in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Paul writes, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. To the Ephesian believers, he declared, although you were once afar off, separate from Christ, strangers and aliens to the promises and the covenant of God, without hope and without God in the world, now you are brought near, for Christ has made the two one, his purpose being to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. That is true 
global humanity in Christ. To stand with many thousands of uh, Baptists gathered from around the world in Tokyo in 1970 and sing all hail the power of Jesus' name, each in his own or her own language, was one of the thrilling, exciting, and unforgettable experiences of life. Even more exciting and moving was the roll call of the nations when a representative from each nation came to the microphone saying in his or her own language or dialect the theme of that Congress which was reconciled in Christ Jesus. But the supremely moving moment came near the end of the roll call of nations when not one but two people approached the microphone. One was black, one was white from South Africa. They came with hands given in a firm clasp and lifted that all might see as they spoke in their respective languages, reconciled in Christ Jesus. That's real globalization. And that is the objective, certainly one of the supreme objectives of God through the redemptive mission and work of Jesus Christ to unite us all under his lordship. Churches, therefore, must be led to think in global terms in our planning and in our budget planning, in our giving, in our thinking, in our praying. How much time have you prayed for the believers in South Africa, in Israel, in Jordan, in Lebanon, where for 15 years They've lived day and night in danger. And in other places of need. How much time have you spent in prayer to God for your brethren in Eastern Europe in these last few weeks? In Russia, with all of the changes that are going on in that giant of a country today? In China? where such brutal, heartless uh, repression was practiced six or eight months ago. How much time have you spent praying for your fellow believers and for the leaders of the nations of the world? How much information have you gathered that would fill your heart and mind and soul with a genuine concern for the evangelization of all the peoples of the world and the alleviation of their suffering and pain. A third characteristic is the Asianization. This is one that hasn't been mentioned before. During the past 15 years, we have seen millions of Asians coming to the Western world. Consider the flood of Chinese entering Vancouver and Toronto today and London. Think of the millions of Asians that have immigrated to all of Western Europe, to Canada and the USA, tens of thousands of them to Middle and South America in these recent years. Although they are feared by many as a threat to job security, they are, in fact, enriching our nations with skills, genius, hard work, and in investments. Our culture, of course, is being and will be greatly influenced and modified by their intertwining with our society. Asian culture, religious concepts, moral values, eagerness for affluence, and zeal for the highest possible degree of education will definitely influence our total society. But what an opportunity for us Christians. We have reluctantly and miserly attempted on a small scale partial obedience to Christ's command to go into all the world and make disciples. 
Now God has brought them next door. What's our excuse now? Will we demonstrate the love of Christ to them with such effectiveness that they will be won to faith in and commitment to our Lord? Will we draw a circle and take them into our fellowship and love? Will we adjust the forms and hours and traditions of our churches to be positive witnesses of Jesus Christ to these who are next door, our neighbors today? What a glorious opportunity God has thrust upon us as these tens of millions of Asians in the last 10 years or 15 have come to be our neighbors. In a city where I was once pastor, Mrs. Scott, Mrs. Carl Scott, searching for something to do so that she could feel useful in the kingdom of God, decided to begin a literacy work among the many wives of service, military servicemen in the air base nearby who had been brought from various countries around the world and most of whom knew very little, if any, English. And Mrs. Scott began that service using the Lawback method of teaching and the New Testament for the trimmer, the first reader, and the love of Jesus Christ to reach out to those hearts. One day she and a Japanese friend whom she had led to Christ knocked on a door they had heard that a Japanese wife lived there who knew no English and was suffering from intense loneliness and homesickness. Nobody answered, but when they knocked on the door itself, it opened. Immediately they smelled gas. And without hesitation, they entered and threw open the windows and doors and went on through the house until they found the bedroom, found the bedroom where the Japanese lady lay unconscious. She had decided upon suicide to end her extreme loneliness. They called the emergency rescue squad and soon she was revived and after some days was back home. But these ladies continued their loving ministry to this woman and months later through the testimony of various ones and especially the Japanese woman who had already become a Christian, she too became a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Some months later, her husband was posted once again to Japan. And there she had the privilege and joy of leading her parents and brothers and sisters to faith in Christ. And in their hometown or city, they started a mission that soon became a church of new believers in a city where missionaries had tried for 20 years to discover a nucleus of believers. One to Christ in a small New Mexico city by a woman who reached out in love to her neighbors who had been brought to her from many parts of the world as an opportunity for witnessing not only to them but through them to their home countries and people. The, Asian, uh, the Asianization of the world refers to more than just the immigration of millions of Asians to our countries. It refers to the limitless outreach of Asian economic and cultural influence on the entire world because of their sheer numbers and their rapidly increasing economic power. Do you recognize, do you realize, I'm sure you do, if you stop and think a moment, 40% of the world's population live in two Asian countries, China and India. And in another 10 years, the population of India will exceed the 1 billion, 200 million of China today. By the end of this century, 
approximately two-thirds of the world's population will be Asian. For remember, Asia begins with Turkey and comes all the way around to the Bering Strait. And you'll be hearing a lot of two terms that are rather new to most of us, the Pacific Rim and the Asian Rim. The Asian Rim refers to the countries right now that begin along about Singapore and come on especially by Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan to all the way to the Bering Strait, including the Philippines, Indonesia, and the other islands, and, and uh, New Zealand and Australia. The Pacific Rim begins around India and comes all the way around to Alaska, the western Pacific coast of Canada, the USA, Middle America, South America, to the very tip of, of Chile, and all of the islands and continents in between. And that, say the strategists and the planners and the st statisticians and, and the prophets, is where the business and the economic growth will be during the 21st century. And already the four tigers, as they are called, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and South Korea, exceed the economic power of Japan. And it is widely spreading to Malaysia, Thailand, and other developing countries. And their economic power will be extremely great. And this offers us opportunity. But the greatest challenge is for us to penetrate those countries with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Will we Christians relax in our recliners or will we seize the crisis opportunities thrust upon us? God is giving us the privilege of joining our lives with his for his divine purpose of all the ages to fill the world with the redemptive knowledge of God as the waters cover the Pacific Rim. With global telecommunications available to us today, we can accelerate the evangelization of the world for Christ if, if we will permit the Holy Spirit to take possession of us so that as in addition to capturing mass media for Christ, we will demonstrate in personal example by self-identification with the suffering of the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. For you see, when God got ready to declare to the world that God is love, he didn't take a heavenly megaphone and broadcast in more than 2,000 languages the gospel. He came to a stable and to a cross. He identified himself with us, took our nature that he might impart to us the privilege of being participants of the divine nature. Amen. Without living personal examples of the love of Christ, it will be hard for people to grasp the concept. An old fellow about my age in uh, <coughs> Vietnam came to one of our missionaries, Bob Davis, one night there in Saigon. He listened to the singing of the songs and the preaching of the gospel. And when everybody else was gone, he was still there. And Bob said, can I help you, son? Do you have a question? And the old man stayed and stayed until, although this was the first time he'd ever heard the gospel, he came that very night to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And his heart overflowed with joy, and so did Bob's. And Bob's asked, 
Sir, what caused you to come and what caused you to stay with such persistence when this was the first time you ever heard the gospel? I don't think I've ever met anybody like that before. And the old man said, when I heard there was a God of love, I wanted to know him. It takes people who know the God of love and in whose heart lives the God of love and whose heart overflows with the love that is flooding our hearts because of the Holy Spirit whom God has given us to be a living demonstration and communicator of that gospel. We need to use every item of telecommunication, whether it be a fax machine, a television, a CD player, or whatever to communicate the gospel, but supremely it has to be communi communicated by allowing Christ to be embodied in our bodies. <coughs> Fifty years ago, and some of my Southern Baptist colleagues will understand how heretical this statement was by Dr. J.M. Dawson that long ago, even today for some uh, whose name, generalized name, I will not call. In Christ and Social Change, Dr. Dawson, a man 50 years ahead of his time, wrote, a religion that holds itself aloof from needy humanity and is occupied with beautiful ritual is a sham. A religion that mumbles its correct creed but neglects the service deed is a fraud. A religion that dreams of a home in heaven but is not concerned with making safe and wholesome homes on earth misses the mark as tragically as the worst sin. It is the religion of a pose, and a pose is the act of hypocrisy, the most heinous sin in Jesus' catalog. We must incorporate the love of God. Seventeen years ago, a pastor began work in the dilapidated, run-down center of Denver, Colorado. For seven long years, they persevered even though growth was negligible, hardly visible at all. Then it came, beginning ten years ago. Today, after 17 years in that location, on every Lord's Day, 10 ethnic congregations meet in that building to worship God in their own language. Now, it takes a bit of work to coordinate 10 services for one day, doesn't it? But wouldn't you like to have that joy? Well, with the coming of the tens of thousands of Chinese to Vancouver and at least 75 large ethnic groups and many other ethnic peoples to Toronto and other parts of Canada, you can have in more places than one. Urbanization is a fourth characteristic of the world tomorrow and tomorrow is today. There are today 111 megacities, cities with more than a million population, in the developed world. And there are about 157 in the other areas of the world. By the year 2025, there will be 486 megacities in the underdeveloped world with only 153 to be found in the developed countries. 486 cities in the underdeveloped countries of the world with a million or more population. But many of those cities will have 10, 15, 17, 20, 30, are 31 or 2 million people in one city. 
this horrendous population in urban, in, in great cities, causes those cities to be characterized by inevitable and unavoidable qualities of life or lack of qualities. Here they are, some of them. Intense loneliness, loss of identity, depersonalization, fierce competitiveness, competitiveness for transportation, housing, jobs, food, position, recognition, etc. Higher costs of living, unhealthy housing in many areas because of the severe crowding together of the poor and indigent in the inevitable ghettos, alienation from society, fear and distrust, crime, hedonism to the extent of being paganism in the raw, high mobility that prevents the development of real community, homelessness, social and moral deviation, violence, and poverty. One of the very serious problems caused by these cities is environmental pollution. Let Mexico City serve as an unfortunate example. Mexico City is located at an altitude of 7,500 feet above sea level. Even so, it's a basin surrounded by higher mountains, causing the clouds and humidity to hang low over that vast, enormous city. According to statistics that I've seen, it's now the world's largest city. Jim Maroney says not yet. <laughs> but uh, by the year 2000, there will be no dispute. It is growing at the rate of a net growth of one million population per year, at least according to one book I just read. This coming together of so many millions of people causes the industries to be multiplied and they spew tons of pollutants into the atmosphere daily. Automobiles, trucks, trains, planes add to that immensely. So also do thousands, tens of thousands of open fires in the ghetto areas where people cook outdoors. It all adds up to huge damage to the lungs of every one of the more than 21 million people who live there today. In fact, it is calculated that the damage to each pair of lungs is equivalent to the smoking of four packs of cigarettes daily, every day that they live there and breathe the pollution of that atmosphere. I know some other cities just about as bad. That's one of the most dr dramatic. Certainly one of the most urgent global concerns of Christians has to be our environment. Christians have a message for that. For you see, in the very beginning of creation, God entrusted this earth with all of its vegetation and animals and material blessings and beauty and wonder to man. Not to be destroyed, but to be cultivated and made more fruitful and more beautiful. You heard about the horticulturist to, some, to whom somebody said about the flowers, we'll say roses. Oh, what beautiful roses God made in your garden. And the gardener said, but you should have seen it when God had it by himself. <laughs> God also depends upon you and me and our faithful trusteeship. We mentioned loneliness. The churches ought to be the prime solvers of the problem of loneliness. The absolute panacea for loneliness should be found in the redemptive fellowship of our churches. Yet all too often, the exceedingly lonely seek relief in the bars. 
not primarily for the alcoholic beverages, but for a listening ear, a sympathetic heart. Could it be that by our condemnation and exclusive, exclusiveness we have shut them out when we really <coughs> want to bring them in? Will we open our hearts to the lonely and hurting and love them to God? God says a beautiful thing several times through Isaiah. I know you by name. When you think of the vastness of this universe, Voyager 2 traveling at 40 or 50,000 miles an hour, launched from this earth, took 10 years to get beyond the last of the planets and maybe has already crossed into the next galaxy. But it's traveling at 10 or 40 or 50,000 miles an hour for 10 years. And that's just across from the earth to the outer boundary of the galaxy, if that far. And yet God says, I know you by name, individually, personally. And he wants us to help the people of the world look to the cross of Calvary with the arms of Jesus outstretched, saying, this is how much God loves you. And this is how much we love you. We are willing to lose ourselves that you may know and experience the love of God. When we come to the realm of biotechnocracy, we're getting into some questions of tremendously serious significance. With recent developments, in the manipulation of genes. As someone has written, this is too serious and sacred a matter to be trusted to the experts alone. Only New Testament values can help us establish those values that must be respected when it comes to the meddling or the manipulation of genes and human personalities and bodies. There are many other related questions about the sanctity of life that we must consider and to which we as Christians must give thoughtful, profound, and spirit-inspired solution or guidance. There's no time for shouting and ranting. The problems are too serious. Some of the benefits uh, promised and prophesied are too wonderful. Some of the dangers are too calamitous to risk. But let me close by mentioning two happy thoughts. A few years ago, in the little tiny kingdom shaped them, of Kuwait, one chaplain was allowed in to minister to the many thousands of expatriates, the imported oil workers. He was forbidden to work with any of the Islamic people. One man, thousands of oil workers, tens and tens of thousands of Islams all around Today, that one chapel has grown to 29 congregational meetings per week with more than 8,000 people in attendance seeking to know the Lord, many thousands of whom are Muslims. And there are three missionary couples, only we can't call them missionaries, chaplains who are assisting that first chaplain in this ministry. When the Russian troops left Afghanistan and relief workers went in, they discovered in many places groups of new believers 
meeting together to study the New Testament. How did these people become believers? There were Baptist soldiers among the Russian troops that bore witness to the people of Afghanistan and led them to Jesus Christ. And groups of believers are spreading in that country today because of the testimony of those Russian soldiers who said, who believed, who obeyed, as you go, make disciples.